so much for having me this morning. It's so good to be here with you guys. Um, what a blessed morning already, hey? Incredible. I just wanted to, before I even begin, I just wanted to take a moment just to honour your pastors, um, Pastor Frank and, and Kathy, and for them um, allowing us the opportunity to come and speak to you and for you guys, even opening the door for you guys to be a part of what Destiny Rescue is doing. Um, so before I begin, I just want to celebrate with you and honour you guys, Southside Church, um, in the commitment that you guys have made over the last however many years you've been supporting us. Um, I was sitting with Pastor Frank at one of the pubs, I think, Lake Lakeview in, in just over near Lake Wendouree and um, was just celebrating with him the fact that um, you guys have partnered with us for so many years and we have seen such an impact come from this church and I just want to present you guys with this. I actually gave this to Pastor Frank. He said, can you please keep this and show it to the church? But I want to present you guys with this. Um, and this isn't just an, another certificate, but this is a representation of six children that you guys have been a part of rescuing. Six children. So incredible, incredible stuff. And um, again, thank you for your generosity and your contribution to um, being such representations of hope and, and being willing to rescue children from, from some dark, dark places. So today, um, God's just really laid a, a message on my heart for you guys. And I want to talk about a little bit about what Destiny Rescue does. Um, but I, also, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the stories that have come out of that um, and, and potentially challenge you further to, to see that this issue is still here with us today. So before we do that, you guys are a praying church, so why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your Holy Spirit right now. We thank you for your presence. We pray, Lord, that you will just um, reveal yourself to us this morning. Lord, we thank you that uh, you have already blessed um, this church and opened up generous hearts, Lord God, to see rescue possible. Lord, we pray that as we walk uh, into a, walk through a journey of stories and, and your word, Lord God, that you will just open our hearts and minds to hearing you, receiving you. Um, and I pray that you will just bless us and bless this church, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Before I begin, um, I want to just make sure that we look after ourselves. Um, some of the things that we are going to talk about this morning will um, be upsetting, disturbing. Um, I've seen the children have actually gone out, which is great. <laughs> but I do encourage you, if, if you want to take some time, please step out, take some time, um, grab someone and pray. Um, but it is going to be a really tough message this morning. Um, our hearts at Destiny Rescue is to live out the Isaiah 61 message. He has, lay, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. This is our mission every day until all children trapped in this kind of evil are free and empowered to stay free. So today I wanna, I wanna share, want to invite you to share in this mission I want to invite you to one of the children. I want, sorry, I want to introduce you to one of the children that we have rescued from this evil, and her name is Dahlia. So before I begin, why don't we watch Dahlia's story? My mother is a drunkard. She's drinking alcohol 
every morning up to evening. So my dad left and I was the one to take care of my little sister. She's four years. She got typhoid. I had to look for money to pay her hospital, buy for her food, to pay house rent. Every day the landlord was coming, knocking, knocking, you give me my money. I felt bad. I was so young. Every time I had to sleep with those months, I was being sick, being sick. I felt ashamed because those men, they were seeing me as a prostitute, just using me to give me money and go. Yeah. And I felt ashamed. I was like, yeah, I'm not a person. Even I felt that God forgot me. Yeah. I feel like killing myself, but I thought I can't give up. Yeah, I can't. I was the one to take care of my sister. You love her very much, don't you? I love, I love her very, very much. I want her to be a good girl. I want in my life to get money and take her to school. I was ashamed. I thought I wasn't a person. I thought that God had forgot me. These are the words of a child who, out of a desperation, lived ashamed, silenced, just so that her little sister could have a life. Like many other children in exploitation, Dahlia felt silenced. It's estimated that one million children are still trapped in this type of exploitation today. And four out of five of those in commercial uh, ex sexual exploitation are women or girls. Sisters, daughters, they've, they've all got stories to tell. In an industry that's generating $99 billion a year, girls just like Dahlia are echoing I'm ashamed, I'm unloved, and I'm forgotten. You see, with the help of our rescue agents and also your support, Dahlia found healing, a voice, and a future. Today, her story isn't one of silence. It's one of restoration. And you guys played a part in that. But I want to challenge us today that this struggle of voice and dignity isn't new. Um, it's actually something that we see in the Bible. And I want to turn with us, if you can, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 34, where we will meet a young girl and her name is Dinah. Now, Dinah is the daughter of Leah, um, who was, her father was Jacob. Um, and we might, we, we, let's jump into these verses. I've got, if you don't have your Bibles, I've got some verses here as well. Now, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land and, in, and when Shechem, the son of Habor, a Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, 
He seized her, laid with her, and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. The story goes on to talk about how Jacob's son negotiates a deal with Hamor and Shechem in the land of Shechem as well, so that they could take Dinah into their possession. However, the story continues. We go on to verse 25. On the third day, when they were... When they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their sword and came against the city. While while it felt secure and uh, killed all the males, they killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their livestock and their herd, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city in the fields, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink in inhabitants, to the inhabitants of the land and the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Dinah, the only daughter of Jacob, What is interesting to me in this story is throughout that whole chapter, she doesn't say a word. Her innocence was taken, she was humiliated, and then she was forgotten. Her father Jacob remained silent about her abuse and her humiliation. But the only time he chooses to speak up is when it's about his own reputation. Dinah's brothers, although angry and sought vengeance, that further saw abuse and humiliation of more women and children. Their pains overlooked. We don't hear her sense of anguish. We don't hear their sense of shame or humiliation. Every single woman in that story remained silent. Now, fast forward hundreds of years later, we're going to jump to John into the New Testament. John chapter 4. There's such a striking contrast in this story. And some of you may know this story already. But John chapter 4, if I can find it myself, here we go. (laughs) Um, We encounter Jesus walking through, and some of you may know this story. It's the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. She, Jesus walks through this play place this town called Samaria or Sikar. Um, and it, the, the word of God says that he had to go through this city to get to where he was going. Now there's historians to say he actually didn't have to. And in fact, as Jews, 
they try and avoid Samaria. But Jesus chose to walk through this city. And he, at the place he stopped, he stopped at the well, and he encountered a Samarian woman. Now, when he stopped, this woman approached to get some water. And any respecting Jew would never be seen in the company of a, a Samarian, nor, nor less be speaking with them. So you can imagine when Jesus asks her for a drink, the surprise that she experienced. So we pick up in verse... Um, Verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samarian woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samarian woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answers her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying this to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, so you have nothing to draw water with and the water is deep. Where do you get living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself and his sons and his livestock. At this point, we can see the woman's very surprised that Jesus is even talking to her. But she's now starting to benchmark who is this Jesus and is he greater than our father Jacob? Now, something that I didn't mention is is Zakar is historically the same place that we used, that the Old Testament calls Shechem. This was the same place that Dinah was attacked and humiliated, and we don't hear her voice. Jesus is now coming into Sakar, Shechem and having one of the longest conversations recorded with a woman in the Bible. But the woman is now benchmarking him to to Jesus and saying, are you greater than our father Jacob? And, And Jesus pretty much says, well, yes. Let's, let's, see the, let's see the what he says. Jesus says to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a living spring of water welling up uh, to eternal life. What, what Jesus is essentially saying is, Jacob may have given you a well. But everybody who comes to this well will continue to come because they continue to be thirsty. But the water I give, the living water that I give to you, is eternal life. You'll never thirst again. Isn't that incredible? As we continue through this story, Jesus identifies that the woman was married five times and in a relationship with someone that is not her husband. She must have been feeling like she was pushed aside. And the reason why I say that is because women were not in charge of making any divorces. So the only reason why she may have had five husbands is if those husbands left her aside. Pushed aside, silenced, ashamed, unloved, forgotten. Yet Jesus turned up to this place and spoke to her. Jesus chose to reveal himself as the Messiah to her. The saviour that was sent by God to redeem his children. 
Now, when we think about these stories, how many of us reflect on those places where we feel like we were in Shechem, where we felt forgotten, ashamed, unloved? I think about Pat's story where we just felt anger, anguish. It's interesting to me that like God just ties different things into his story. And what I want to encourage you, you this morning is that Jesus has turned up to give you living water, eternal life. And he's here to hear you hear your story and redeem you. So from these these three at uh, these two stories I wanted to highlight three things that God does throughout these these stories. God remembers. Although people like Dinah's life didn't speak up, uh, sorry, although the people in Dinah's life didn't speak up and we not once heard her voice. God's heart ached for Dinah. The fact that God divinely inspired Dinah's story to be documented and also then for Jesus to visit the very location where Dinah's story took place to speak with a Sumerian woman shows that God remembers. God restores, point number two. Jesus has a conversation with this Samaritan woman. He tells her, the living water that I give you will become a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Jesus releases her from the heavy burden that she was carrying, the shame and the feeling of being discarded, to now Jesus drawing her into the love of God. I want to quickly jump towards the end of this story because what happens is after this conversation, the disciples come back um, and what we see is this woman running to her village. Let me jump into... All right, 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do with the will of whom... uh, Will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work... Do you not say, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that for which you did not labour. Others have laboured and you have entered into their labour. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. And then the Samaritans came to him. They asked him to stay with them and he stayed there for two days. And many more believers believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves that we know that uh, this is indeed the saviour of the world. How incredible is that, that she has just been restored by Jesus given her dignity, her voice, and now she is running to the village. Point number three, God redeems. The story 
that through this story, the Samaritan woman, we not only see the Samaritan woman run to the village and tell the people what she has experienced, but we see many Samarian, the Samaritans who are rejected or even discarded by a Jewish community come to be at the feet of Jesus and a whole community is redeemed. How incredible is that? That one person who is broken, unheard of, can turn their life around. Jesus turns her life around in one conversation and she sees a multitude of people turn to Jesus. Her story wasn't just one of pain, it was one of re- restoration and redemption. God remembers you. God wants to restore you. And God wants to redeem your story and the people around you. He wants to redeem your story so that you can help God redeem other people's stories. I want to share another story with you. This girl's name is Zarifa. Why don't we watch that now? My family didn't have a button to drop out of school so that I can look for a job. My life was just I can see a mess. I need to be long for myself. I need to be who I am. Rescue gave me food. They gave my family food. They gave my mother a job, which really helped us, my sister and my brother, to go to school. After they rescued, I didn't drop out of school, and they passed my exams, say, I'm going to join you first. But when I came here, I felt secure, I felt protected, and I was so happy. They really advised us so very much, and it really changed my mentality of thinking. I started going to church. I became a leader in church, which I wasn't expecting. I lead in singing the praise and worship. Really feel so happy. Rescue makes worship possible. How powerful is that? Zarifa was given a voice because of partnerships like you. Our rescue agents, again, were able to identify her rescue and bring her back into the dignity and freedom so that she can have a voice to worship. Zafira was remembered by God, restored by God, and redeemed by God. You know, there's many other stories that I could share with you this morning, like M, who her voice became a voice to the community. Sally, who now goes down and helps feed children who are vulnerable. These are just some of the stories that God has remembered restored and redeemed. So today, as we not only celebrate the impact, but hear the stories and hear the stories of impact that Southside has been a part of, I want to challenge you that there's still more to be done. Dahlia, Zarifa, M, Sally, these are just stories of Sorry, technical difficulties. Um, Over 17,000 stories that have been rescued, restored and redeemed to date. 
Um, last year, we saw over 3,300 stories of, of children being remembered, restored, and redeemed. However, there's still one million who are still telling themselves, I'm ashamed, I'm unloved, and I'm forgotten. So my invitation to you today is join in on this mission. Continue to join in on this mission. Continue to pray. Continue to reflect on these children's stories. Reflect on the goodness of God in our lives so that we could have a story. But I invite you to remember these children who are crying out in the silence, saying to themselves, I'm ashamed, I'm unloved, and I'm forgotten. I invite you to help restore these lives and see them redeemed, allowing them to raise their voices to worship and to impact a generation with their story. This morning, I invite you to step in to make a powerful difference. We know Southside's committed. They're committed already to seeing, and you guys are committed already to seeing at least one child rescued each year. We've seen six so far, which is incredible. Today, we celebrate those lives of those six children who are free, but imagine this. What if I came next year and we saw that celebration doubled? What if we came back next year and we could celebrate 12 children who were remembered, restored, and redeemed, and now are worshipping our Heavenly Father and telling their story so that they can see their generation remembered, restored, and redeemed. So I need people who are willing to say yes, $1,800 is what it takes to rescue a child. That's $150 a month. I don't know about you, but I love my coffee. <laughs> um, and when I get a chance to, I'll have a really nice, good cup of coffee. Um, $150 a month is one coffee a day. I have multiple a day, <laughs> so I can definitely give up one. $150 a month sees one life rescued. If we could see just 11 people in this room committing to that mission, by next year, we would be celebrating the fact that there are 12 children rescued, remembered, restored, and redeemed. 12 children. So I want to encourage you, will you say yes to this rescue, to freedom, to redemption? If this is something that you are wanting to be a part of, there's a QR code there. I'll be up the back. Come and chat to me. Come and help us. Come join this fight for freedom. Come and rescue, restore and redeem untold stories. Together, let's see this impact bring true, lasting change for the glory of God. Amen. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for how beautiful your word is. We thank you for what your Holy Spirit has revealed to us, Lord God, and I just pray that as we sit as a community of faith, Lord, as people who are remembered by you, who are restored by you, and who are redeemed by you, that we find the courage and the compassion to be able to rise up and join and stand in this mission to see more children remembered by you, restored by you, and redeemed by you. Lord God, we pray that you will take our fruits and see them multiplied and see generations come to know you, Lord God. We pray that you'll bless Southside. We pray that you continue to bless them. 
and continue to see an impact. And Lord, we thank you for their generosity already for seeing six lives that we celebrate, Lord God. And we praise you, Jesus, for this time together. We praise you for your word. We praise you that your Holy Spirit is revealing and working in us to come closer to you and to love you even more, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.